Easy, right. So uh, I'm Andreas Hagman. I'm from Royal Holloway University in, in London, UK. I'm going to be speaking today about some of my research I'm doing as part of my uh, PhD, which is on wargaming uh, in the cyber attack space. May I a clicker? So just a little bit about what I'm going to cover. So I'm going to tell you what wargaming is, in case you've never heard of it. I'm going to talk a little bit about why you should care about it and what it can do for you. Uh, and I want to cover um, why wargaming in the cyberspace can be particularly difficult. Uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my particular research and the games I've uh, And then I'm going to stop speaking at some point uh, and you'll be all pleased to hear that. So let's start off with, with what wargaming is. Quick show of hands, when you saw the title for this talk, who thought about X? Because that's uh, not at all what I'm going to talk about. Of course, is a screenshot from the uh, 1980 movie War Games with Matthew Broderick, uh, which is where many people know this, this particular term from. But banish that from your minds. What I'm actually going to talk about uh, is cool wargaming as done on tabletop board games. Uh, so the, the brief history of that really started out with something like chess. If you think about it, chess, uh, the, the chess playing field is a mod model of a battlefield, and the pieces are pieces that will go in an army, uh, and the, the players navigate the army around the battlefield and try to defeat them. Uh, the other two games here, the one in the middle is Risk, which I'm sure you've all a game about resource management and basically taking over the world. Uh, and the other game, uh, I forget the name, but um, it, that's, a, that's a more, uh, uh, how to say, perhaps the military might use that for planning operations and things like that. So I'm going to talk about uh, these kinds of War games. Uh, these are some flavors, might be different, um, but it's very much um, a non technical approach to, to this space. Maybe that's better. So, that's sort of the what of what I'm going to talk about. Now, you're obviously wondering, why the hell is this guy standing here talking to me? I don't care about board games, I'm a cybersecurity guy, right? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about what wargaming can do for you. Uh, and I've got three main things for you. The first is wargaming have this real great power uh, to allow the players to express their creativity. Wargames create a scenario, uh, or they should use a scenario, where, where the players must use their imagination to engage with it, um, and also uh, make decisions within, within the game, which obviously requires some lateral thinking. And that's the second point, is decision making. Um, it's really key to a war game. The game must force players to come to a point where they must decide whether they should act on A or B, and they must be able to weigh up the risks and the rationale why they're choosing that decision, and hopefully talk through that in an open way, so that they, they publicly understand, if you will, why they're making a decision. Uh, that's where the main learning outcomes from the war game, as far as I see it, comes from. And the third point um, is that war games are social, or gaming is social. Uh, for those of you who don't know how this, this particular uh, episode in Family Guy ends, Stewie flips the table and walks out of the room. Um, but the point is that games have this great power of bringing people together in a social setting. And it's when you work with other people, literally in close contact, it's when you get the most um, out of any engaging uh, learning um, tool. So that's a little bit about what war, war games or gaming might do for you in general. Um, but you might ask, well, we're doing cybersecurity, it's all computers and technology and stuff, right? Why is he concentrating on, on manual board games on a tabletop? So I'm going to offer three reasons for that. The first is with a manual game, the rules for the game are openly available to everyone and they're right in front of you. They have the rule book and you can see why a particular event in the game happened as it did. If you roll a dice, you can see why the outcome was as it was, because there's a results table. Uh, and you can then rationale uh, about why, um, or, or whether that is accurate to the real world or not. Perhaps your interpretation of the real world doesn't fit in with, with what the rule book says. And then you can redesign it as you wish. And that's the second point, is that because the rules are open and they're not a black box, and they're manual, there's no skills needed to tinker with it. So if you want to change something, you can just change it. You say, okay, well, the get rule set says I must roll a six, but actually I think it would be more accurate to, to roll a five on the dice, and, and that would get the outcome. So you can change it literally as you go along. 
um, depending on, on player agreement and whether you can convince other players that, that you are right. Um, and then finally, <laughs> manual board games save you uh, hopefully a bit of money. Uh, developing video games is quite an expensive venture if you want to do a proper you know, AAA game. Um, Wargaming, uh, because they don't require a huge amount of technical expertise to develop, um, are far more cost effective. Um, and with my research in particular, because I'm a PhD student, um, if people want to play my games, it doesn't cost them anything. So super cheap. That's my little plug. <clears throat> now, there are some problems with wargaming in the sort of cyber environment. They're very particular to, to cyber. I'm going to go through three of, three of the problems um, that I've grappled with throughout, throughout my research. So the first is the problem of space. So normally when you make a war game, a board war game, you'll take the battlefield you want to play on, uh, which in this case is Middle Earth, you slap a big grid on it and you say, okay, that's, that's basically my map. You might have to do a little bit of redrawing to make sure the contours fit with, with the grid. You can use a square or hex or whatever, whatever grid you're using. Uh, but that's basically the process and, and it's relatively simple. The problem is, if cyberspace looks like this, then you can't really slap a grid on it. I mean, that's, that's just... Nonsense, numbers, ones and zeros, and things floating about. There's no structure to it as such. So how do you make a, a 2D playing field out of what is essentially not even 3D space? It's, it's non-space. And that's sort of one of the challenges uh, I've had to grapple with. Luckily, wargaming isn't necessarily, as a field, isn't necessarily uh, unaccustomed to dealing with strange spaces. So with the developments in warfare, they've had to deal with new dimensions elsewhere. So the first uh, picture, the top one, is a picture of an anti-submarine warfare game, which obviously deals with, with naval combat, which is in three dimensions. Um, but it still plays out on a 2D board. And they use some novel, novel uh, mechanisms to, to deal with that. But the, the, the other picture is, is possibly my favorite war game of all time. And it's a, picture, uh, it's a game that deals with um, Aerial dogfighting in World War I, so aeroplanes you know, above you know, the Western Front and that sort of thing. And this is the early days of, of, of air power, mind you. So this game was made in, uh, was made, it wasn't made around that time, it was made in, in the 70s and 80s, various editions. But the way the game works is uh, each player in this two players get a flip book with pictures in it. And on the picture you can see you, you have the view from your, co your cockpit in your aeroplane. And you must decide from the uh, range of available moves at the bottom of the page what you want to do. Do you want to fly straight? Do you want to do a loop, veer left? What are you going to do? Likewise, the other player chooses their move, and they will have a different book with a different view, so they will see from the other plane, as it were, and they choose a move. And you call out your moves simultaneously, and you flip to the corresponding page, and you end up uh, at a new position, whatever. It works it out. It's really, really clever. Um, and I think this is a fantastic example of wargaming using very novel techniques to solve a difficult problem of, uh, of dimensionality, if you will. Um, now, I haven't made a flipbook game, but the point is that the wargaming is used to dealing uh, with, with tricky problems of, of space. Uh, next problem is one of time flow. So in, say, historical wargaming, you can take a battle or campaign or whatever it is you're doing and you can quite easily map it to, to, to a time space. So if you take the Battle of Waterloo uh, in 1815, started at about 11 o'clock and finished at about 10 at night. So you can easily divide that time chunk into, say, 11 hours uh, of, of action, one hour being each turn of the game. Uh, and what you find is that the, the level of action performed by the, the troops on the field is relatively constant during that time. So you can then map the, um, the, 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 their capabilities according to, to what they will be able to do in an hour. So an infantry troop might be able to move two squares, whereas a cavalry might be able to move four, or something like that. And that's relatively easy to, to manage, and because the time flow is constant, players don't get a lot of confusion because every turn represents the same amount of time. But if we use an example from cyberspace, if you will, take something like the Sony hack, um, you might envisage a time flow something like this. You don't know when it started, you don't know when it ended, you, it's still ongoing as far as if we, if we look at the ongoing repercussions. So you could have sort of first instance, 
uh, or the first little spike might be the, the initial network scanning and, and, uh, and they get some data from that and then the attackers go away. And all they're, they're working sort of in their own space to, to find vulnerabilities in, in the scans they've found, but they're, they're not actually doing anything to attack the network. And then the big spike you see is when they actually penetrate the network and they, they exploit those vulnerabilities, right? But then again, once they're in, they might not do a lot because they're just sitting there accelerating command and control and that sort of thing. And then the next spike is when they actually start exfiltrating data. And there's another big spike, and then they might do that for a while, and then they calm down a little bit because they've achieved what they wanted to do. And then finally, you see uh, the breach being discovered. And that's when all hell kicks loose, right? Because Sony needs to react, and the US reacts, and it all gets diplomatic, and North Korea is involved, and all that stuff. And that's obviously still ongoing if you consider uh, the economic sanctions on North Korea. So my point is here is it's not so easy to divide something like uh, uh, a cyber attack into nice equal chunks on a timeline. A, because you don't know how long the timeline is, and B, because, I mean, that spike might be milliseconds, but the time in between might be months or years. So how do you divide that into turns if you were going to game the Sony hack? How would you divide that into turns um, where each turn represents the same amount of time? It would be very, very difficult. And if you don't do that, uh, players can get very confused about what's actually going on. So, final problem with cyberspace um, is one of visibility. So, I use this slide to talk about deterrence as well, but I'm not going to talk about deterrence. Uh, but I want to talk about visibility. So, normally when you create a war game, you can see the, the weapons that are going to be in it, because you can, you, know, you can count missiles, you can see how big they are. So, if I wanted to make a game about nuclear warfare, I would simply go and look at all these pictures of nice things, and I would look down the tables of all the capabilities of all the different nations, and I could then turn that into data for the game. But with cyber, that's your missile, right? But a USB stick isn't going to do you much good um, if you want to try to determine someone's capabilities. This might have Stuxnet 3.0 on it. In this case, it only has a PowerPoint presentation, completely innocuous. So there's a real difficulty in finding out what people's actual capabilities are and then mapping those into, into a game um, where, where it's actually usable. Uh, and that's when you have to do a little bit of uh, guesswork, I suppose, or estimation, um, rather than working with, with hard, raw data. So those are three, I think, significant problems that I've had to grapple with, at least. So let's have a look at some of the stuff I've done uh, as part of the, the PhD, PhD research. So I've got two main games, I suppose. This first one was my proof of concept that I created uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, and it... It is a tactical level game, so it involves two players. Uh, the setup is actually different from this, I should add. This is a nice picture just to show you guys what it's kind of all about, but it's actually played on two separate game boards where players can't see each other's moves. Uh, kind of like battleships, if you've ever played battleships. Um, but players must navigate uh, a network, a, com a very sort of visualized computer network, to the, the attacker, which in this case is, is Russia, uh, must try to infiltrate Shell, which is a defender, infiltrate their network, find some valuable cyber loot, IP or employee databases, things like that, and exfiltrate those back to, to their own side. <laughs> Shell, meanwhile, tries to defend against this by placing defensive firewalls and by just catching Russia in the act physically on the game board. Uh, and that, that was very much a, a yeah, tactical level simulation, if you will, although obviously not very accurate, it's very abstract. Um, uh, looking at uh, navigating networks. But I figured uh, this approach was probably not right um, because war games are quite abstract. They're very abstract, in fact. Um, so if you're going to use an abstract medium, you're better off dealing with an abstract concept because otherwise you get a sort of disjoint between what you're trying to achieve and what you're using to achieve it. So I have moved on from, from that proof, proof of concept, which was very well received, uh, to a game about strategy. So the sort of main game, which is the one I'm using at the moment uh, in the research, is, is based on the UK national cybersecurity strategy. And when you read that, you find, find that it's sort of centered around a, a trinity of three components of government, business, and people. Um, and this is sort of the central feature of the strategy which the, the UK says they, they need to keep these safe to, to, to prosper and be, be a secure nation. To that, I've added critical infrastructure and military intel intelligence, uh, because I think those five um, make a sort of, make, those five really, rather than the three, 
are, are, are key to, to uh, any cybersecurity strategy. So this game is less about actually moving and maneuvering your playing pieces around the network, and it's more about managing limited resources to achieve conflicting objectives. So each team, it's UK versus Russia again. I'm sorry to pick on Russia. Oh, I'm not sorry. Um, each team uh, gets, they have resources and they have health points and they have to, to manage those resources to, to achieve objectives. And each team has different objectives. It's impossible to achieve all objectives, so players have to decide, that key uh, argument again, which objectives they want to achieve. Uh, and they have to reason why they're achieving one objective instead of another. And, and you can get some really, really fun arguments going within teams um, about which objectives are more important, even though they're worth the same amount of, of victory points as it were. So th that's sort of the space that I've been working in. Hopefully that gives you a little bit of, um, of an idea of, of what I've been sort of doing. So let's have a, I'm, I'm halfway through the PhD research. There's not a lot of results as such to tell you about, but I can give you some, some tentative um, things. So with the tactical proof of concept game, uh, the sort of uh, results table looks something like this. So out of 15 games total played, Shell won 13, and they outscored uh, Russia by, by uh, more, than, more than double on average. So that tells you one of two things. It either tells you that if the model, the game model is accurate, then in real life, Shell is very well placed to defend against Russia. They're fine. I mean, they'll win a lot of time. Or it tells you that the model is completely skewed, because these aren't the results you will get in real life. I suspect it's the latter. Uh, because I think if, if Russia took on Shell, um, you would see a lot more red on, on those graphs. So that, that tells you that the, the model needs changing, and that's fine. If, if the players can recognize that when they're playing it, then you're getting a lot of learning outcomes out of it, because they can see uh, the value of the game and, and how, uh, how it relates to their real-world problems and, and, and organization. Um, so with, with the strategy game, uh, there aren't any, any graphical results as such, but I'll show you a few uh, pictures of it in action, uh, as it were. And I think the key message I want to get across with these pictures is you can see the social side of it. I've had to blur faces, but you can kind of see that everyone's engaging. You, you, you can't really see it, but I guarantee you they're having fun. And fun is one of the mo most... Uh, engaging things you can do if you want to get something across, make people have fun without them knowing they're having fun, by the way. Um, and so far, I mean, the, these four particular pictures, uh, everyone there loved the games, thought it was great, uh, they got lots out of it, lots of lots of good feedback, and not, not only about um, so the learning outcomes, but also about the game itself, uh, which is equally valuable. Because if they can recognize a fault with the game and say, oh, why is this missing? Or I don't think that should be represented in this way, then you've achieved something. Because they're thinking about the cybersecurity issues that are represented in the game through the game itself, as it were. So I'm going to wrap up with this quote. And I think the reason I wanted to put this quote on here was because in your organization, you might have a lot of really clever technical people doing some brilliant things. You might also have some, some really, really good, brilliant business people um, bringing you a lot of, a lot of sales and, and doing the effective marketing and all that. But sometimes <clears throat> the best way to engage even, even these really brilliant minds is to do something really simple uh, as a game. So the source of this quote, um, I'm sure you won't be surprised, is our own uh, Captain James T. Kirk. And on that, I thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. Uh, thanks, Andres. Uh, questions? Seems that not, 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 not yet. Uh, anyway, Andres will be all day here, uh, so feel free to, 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 to visit him somewhere in the expo area. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, sure. Second. Uh, where, okay, so where we question, could get question the is, games. Can, can you get my games? Um, <laughs> may, give me a couple of years, maybe. So the, the best way at the moment, email me and we can have a conversation about what can be done. But they're not necessarily available as such. There's, the tactical one I can send you, but the strategy one uh, we need to have a conversation about, yeah. Okay, thank you. Ah, thanks. Thank you.